Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson. In the previous videos we've talked about how we can take a matrix A and we can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix. And In some cases we can write a diagonal representation for this. We can express this as a similarity transform between some matrix A and some diagonal matrix where the diagonal matrix has the eigenvalues on the diagonal entries. So the question we talk about today is if we get complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors from our matrix, can we still do a a diagonalization or something similar. So let's take a look. So if we consider this example, we're given some matrix A and we've already found the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and they look like this. We have complex eigenvalues and then the associated complex eigenvectors. Now if we were just following the rules of our diagonalization, we would simply look for A equal to P times D times P inverse. Now this certainly doesn't look like a very friendly diagonalization, and actually it's just not what we want to do. So part of the advantage of having a diagonalization is allow us to see inside what the transformation was really doing in terms of the diagonal matrix. But here, I don't really know what it means to scale um, some, some up vector by 1 minus 2i. So these complex values really hide the meaning. For example, let's think about regular diagonalization. If I ask some matrix A, and I can diagonalize as shown, I can write it as P times D times P inverse. And if I apply this to some vector, so for instance I look at A times X, which would then be P times D times P inverse times X, what this product is really telling me is that first, when I think about this product, when I take a basis of eigenvectors, which really is what defines the matrix P, then this product should give me the coordinates of x in terms of those eigenvector basis. So in other words, that first product of p inverse times x is changing my basis to the eigenbasis. From there, I do the transformation, d, and lastly, I change my basis back. But the reason it's such a great basis is when I look at d, I can see exactly what that transformation is doing. It's just scaling me in my basis directions. However, when I had those complex values, I didn't know what that meant. I would like to think about my complex diagonalization, or whatever we're going to call it, in the same similar way, though. The problem is I need to work with real values instead of complex values. So in other words, to summarize, to better characterize my transformation, I would like to have a representation that used only real numbers. So how would I go about doing that? Let's look back at our example, with our matrix A and our complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And I'm going to start by trying to form that matrix P. Because I'm going to try to find two eigenvectors that are a basis for my eigenspace that I can use as the columns of P. Well, I have my two eigenvectors, so these should really be a basis for my eigenspace. And therefore, any linear combination of these two vectors should also be in my eigenspace. So let's look at one specific linear combination of these two eigenvectors. For instance, let's define a new vector, x3. And we're going to define this to be 1 half of x1 plus 1 half of x2. So to do this calculation, I'm going to want to look at my eigenvectors and rewrite them into maybe a little cleaner form. This first vector will be 1, 1 minus i times 0, 1. And the second eigenvector will be as conjugate. It will be 1, 1 plus i times 0, 1. So now as I take that first eigenvector, I'll call this one x1, and I multiply that by a half, I will get 1 half 1 1 minus 1 half i times 0 1 plus 1 half 1 1 plus 1 half i 0 1. But when I look at this sum, I know that these two values will cancel out. And since I have half of this vector plus another half, the result is the whole vector. So x3 is really equal to 1, 1. And this should be in my eigenspace. So now let's find another vector. Let's do this again. Let's create a new vector, x4. This vector is going to be negative 1 half times the quantity negative i times x1 plus i times x2. So once again, this is just a linear combination of my eigenbasis. When I actually calculate these pieces out, well, I get negative i times x1. That would be a negative i times 1, 1 
but then be a negative i times this. The negatives cancel out, but I still am left with i times i, which is negative 1. And so I'm left with this piece. And I'm going to add my next piece here. This is plus i times 1, 1, and plus i times this piece. But once again, i times i is negative 1, so I get minus 0, 1. And now I look to simplify. I see my two complex pieces cancel out again. I'm left with minus two of these. When I multiply that by a negative one half, the result is positive zero one. So when all this is said and done, I've created two new vectors. I now have the vector one one and the vector zero one. These two vectors are certainly in the eigenspace because I formed them as a linear combination of the eigenbases. But by inspection, I can look at these and say that they're not multiples of each other. Therefore, they must be linearly independent. Since I know the original dimension of the eigenspace was 2, and now I have two linearly independent vectors from that eigenspace, this must also be a basis for that space. And so what I have here is a new basis for my eigenspace that's composed of strictly real vectors. And what real vectors? If I go back to my original eigenvectors, I see that these two vectors I've created are really just the real part and the imaginary part of those complex eigenvectors. And this is what I'm going to use to create my matrix P. So to summarize, if my eigenvector is some real vector, plus or minus i times some imaginary vector, the imaginary part of this vector, then take my matrix P and let the first column be the real part and the second column be the imaginary part. In my specific case, I'm letting P equal the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. And this will be my matrix P. But now that I have my matrix P, and once again, once I have that, I can calculate the inverse, I still need to figure out what D is. I don't want to just have a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on those diagonal entries. Well, to figure out what this similar matrix has to be, I'm going to write the similarity transform. I have A equal to P times some matrix times P inverse. But if I multiply on the left on both of the sides by P inverse, I would be left with P inverse times A equals D times P inverse. Now I'll right multiply by the matrix P to get to P inverse times A times P equals just D. And this way, I can actually take my P inverse, take my matrix A, take my matrix P, do that multiplication, and I'll see what the result is. So let's do that. My matrix P was 1, 0, negative 1, 1. My matrix A is negative 1, 2, negative 4, and 3. The inverse matrix is going to turn out to be 1, 0, 1, 1. To see that, I can see that the determinant of P is just 1 minus 0, which is 1. And then I just have to switch the values on the strong diagonal and change the sign of the off diagonal. And this is the result. So now I'm actually going to do that multiplication. I'll leave that first matrix alone and multiply the second two. When I look at that product, I get 1, 2, negative 1, and 3. And when I multiply these two pieces together, I get the matrix 1, 2, negative 2, and 1. And this here would be my matrix D. But actually, in this case, it's not a diagonal matrix. So I'm going to give it a new name, not marked it by D. In fact, I'm going to call it C this time. So it looks like A is really equal to P times the similar matrix C times P inverse. And this matrix C is really characterizing the transformation. And it turns out to be a special matrix, because I've seen this pattern before, where I have the same values on the strong diagonal. And the only difference between the values on the off diagonal is a sign. I've seen this before when I've looked at rotational matrices. And so it turns out that buried deep inside of our transformation A, really in disguise, if we think about this in terms of the right basis, we're actually doing a rotation. So let's frame that again with our original diagonalization. But it turns out this isn't any just rotational matrix. It turns out that these values, 1 and 2 and negative 2 and 1, these are really just the real and imaginary parts of my eigenvalues. So to summarize this, for A with lambda complex, which is equal to A minus BI, and the associated eigenvectors, 
that also have real and imaginary parts. We've already seen that by matrix P, that first column should be the real part of the complex eigenvector, and the second column is the imaginary part of the complex eigenvector. But now we can also see that the similarity transform tells us that A is similar to this matrix C, which is formed with the real and imaginary parts of the eigenvalue. Now what does this actually tell us? If we recall that when we had A is equal to P times D times P inverse, we said that if I thought of this as taking some X and doing a mapping, a transformation on that X, it's the same thing as P times D times P inverse times X. So if we take X and we multiply it by A and it maps to some vector A times X, it's really the same thing as first changing the basis by multiplying by the P inverse. Now we'll get our vector in terms of this new basis. And then we apply our transformation D, which is much easier to recognize because it's diagonal, to get some other value. And then we multiply by P to change our basis back. And we're going to end up in that same place. The only difference now for the complex case is that when we change our basis, now instead of our matrix D, we have a rotation. It's also much easier to understand than our original matrix A. So first we change the basis, we do our rotation, and then we change the basis back. And that's the representation for this similarity transform. And that concludes this video. Thank you.